Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm Maggie Williams. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics, and I want to thank our panel for joining us tonight. Our panelists are public policy thought leaders, contributors, and publishers of a collection of essays entitled Room to Grow, Conservative Reforms for a Limited Government and a Thriving Middle Class. I have read the essays, and I commend them to anyone who is interested not just in policy ideas, but in translating policy into action. Our moderator, Kristen Soltis Anderson, will have the pleasure of introducing our panelists, but I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator. But for a few words about her. Kristen is a current IOP fellow. She is a fantasy football player, <laughs> former lead singer in a rock band, and one of the most insightful minds in American politics today. A columnist, a Republican strategist, she is a co-founder of Echelon Insights, an opinion research firm. She is a much read, much discussed, and much quoted contributor to the Daily Beast, the Huffington Post, and a number of online print and, and print publications. She was named one of Time's 30 Under 30 Changing the World for her research on changes in our country's elections and voting behavior. And just a personal word about Kristen. Kristen is what my mother used to tell me I should strive to be, a person who says yes. In her life, in her work, all of us have noticed at the Institute that she says yes. She says yes to promoting new ideas. She said yes to starting her own firm. She said yes to being a careful listener. I mean, she listens, she really listens to young people about their lives and the changes that affect their politics and voting. She also says yes to seeking a positive vision for the future and yes to belief in a new generation of American politics. So we are so thrilled and so proud to have her at the Institute of Politics. Kristen. Thank you very much, Maggie. And thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, we are in line to have an amazing discussion, I think, about uh, something that's very important to the future of politics, uh, the, the future of the Republican Party, the future of the conservative movement, and sort of the prospect for ideas, policy solutions, and where that fits in uh, to the future as we're looking to 2014, but more 2016 and beyond. Uh, so it is my honor tonight to introduce you to our three panelists. Uh, directly to my left is uh, Ramesh Panuru. He is a senior editor at National Review, where he covered national politics and public policy for 18 years. Uh, Panuru is also a columnist for Bloomberg View. He's a prolific writer, uh, an author of a monograph about Japanese industrial policy, and a book about American politics and the sanctity of human life. Uh, at AEI, Panuru examines the future of conservatism with particular attention to healthcare, economic policy, and constitutionalism. Ramesh, thank you for being here. Welcome. Uh, directly to his left uh, is April Panuru. Uh, April is the policy director for YG Network. Uh, Panuru has extensive experience on Capitol Hill. She served in both the US House and Senate leadership offices uh, and has worked in the conservative movement. Sort of prior to joining YGN, she was senior advisor to Senate Republican Conference Vice Chairman Roy Blunt uh, and has been a senior advisor to Roy Blunt when he was House <coughs> Majority Whip. She's also the former executive director of the nonprofit National Review Institute founded by William F. Buckley Jr. and was National Review Magazine's vice president. Uh, and last but not least, on the end, uh, we have Pete Weiner. Uh, Pete Weiner is a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Uh, he writes for numerous political, cultural, religious, writes on political, cultural, religious, and national security issues. Uh, and contributes regularly to commentary magazines, uh, blog contentions, contentions, as well as for numerous other publications. Uh, he also served uh, in the Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations prior to becoming uh, de deputy director of speech writing for President George W. Bush. And then in 2002, he was tapped to head the Office of Strategic Initiatives, where he generated policy ideas, reached out to public intellectuals, published op-eds and essays, uh, and then later served as a senior advisor to the Romney Ryan 2012 presidential campaign. Thank you all for being here. For uh, so to start things <coughs> off, um, one of the, the sort of central terms that we'll be talking about tonight is this concept of reform conservatism. 
Um, many of you, I see, have copies of Room to Grow. Uh, it's the publication that was put out earlier this year by the YG Network. It's sort of a collection of essays focused on policy solutions uh, that sort of center, right of center policymakers uh, might have the opportunity to grab onto and to promote. It, it provides sort of a positive vision for the conservative <coughs> movement. And with it, this term reform conservatism has sort of moved into the mainstream. Uh, reform conservatism, the first time I heard it, it was sort of referring to a collection of very smart bloggers and think tank folks uh, who wanted to see uh, the conservative movement uh, sort of reborn and, and, and becoming more electorally relevant, um, as well as being a, a fountain of ideas. Uh, and with the dawn of uh, Room to Grow, I think reform conservatism has become a more common term. But because it is still sort of emerging, I'm interested in your definitions of it. And Ramesh, I'll start with you. How would you define the term reform conservatism, and why does it matter? Well, um, I think the first thing to say about reform conservatism is it's a pro-family movement. <laughs> uh, we, we decided to have, as a strategy, to start with the Panuru household and then, uh, and then work our way outward. Um, you know, I didn't, uh, I've never really loved the, uh, the term reform conservatism and, and how exactly it got attached to us all is, sort of, is a little bit lost in the mists of time. Um, people who are identified as reform conservatives have some disagreements about some important matters. But I do think that there are some points of agreement that are important and maybe uh, a little bit distinctive. And one of those points of agreement is that conservatism needs to be updated that conservative insights have to be applied to the circumstances of today, uh, and too often conservatives have been relying on a program, uh, a set of policies that were designed in the late 1970s and the early 1980s uh, under very different circumstances. And those policies and that agenda don't speak as much to people today, uh, in part because that agenda was successful. We don't have a top income tax rate of 70%, for example, as we did in the late 1970s, uh, and conservatism just sort of has to move on. So that's one point, the need to update and modernize conservatism to apply it to today's circumstances. Another is that in particular, there is a disconnect between conservatism and the American middle class, that people identify the conservative movement and the Republican Party with the economic interests of rich people and big business, to the exclusion of the interests of most people in this country, and that that is the central political problem that um, Republicans and conservatives face today. And when you solve the intellectual problem of modernizing the agenda, you also will go a long way to solving that political problem. April, I'd like to pass this question along to you. How do you define reform conservatism, and why do you think this moment in time uh, is one where reform conservatism really matters? Right. Well, thanks for having us. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting. Um, so many people are in the country are, are sort of uh, disillusioned with politics. I think part of the reason for that is that there's really tired agendas. You know, there's that we're working off of checklists. I think both Republicans and Democrats um, that we developed a really long time ago, and nobody can quite remember why. Uh, it's shrouded in the mist of time. Why we are uh, still you know, pushing some of the policies that we're pushing. And there was a sense that we needed, like Ramesh said, to sort of update that, to think about, um, you know, first, what are people concerned about? And I think, you know, Pete does a great job of identifying what are sort of the, the broad base of concerns that most Americans have in this country. And then what are we doing to speak to those concerns? And there was a sense in which Republicans didn't have a lot to offer um, folks that were in the middle class. You know, we'd have to make a sort of tortured argument about uh, how, you know, if we cut the top rate, then, then maybe we would uh, be, you know, promoting job growth, and then that would eventually be good for uh, middle class Americans. But there wasn't sort of a sense in which we had something to offer um, an average voter. And I think that that was a lot of it. I think another important distinction to make is that uh, reform actually refers, I, you know, when we say reform conservatism, we're not thinking so much about reforming conservatism, because I think all of us would very much you know, identify ourselves as conservatives and very much, um, you know, out of that tradition. It's um, offering reforms, right, that come out of our philosophy. And so, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's been a real pleasure to be able to think creatively. And I think that's why it's happening now is that there's a sense that there's a vacuum in Washington and that we need to come up with some new ideas. And so here we are. 
And Pete, I, I throw this question to you as well. You were sort of given the weighty task of writing the introductory chapter to, to Room to Grow, which has sort of become this, the manifesto of reform conservatism, if you will. Uh, how do you define it? What, what, were, what, were you, what were your thoughts as you were going through and writing the introduction to, to this book? Yeah, thanks again for, for having us. It's a pleasure to be here, and, and thanks for, uh, to all of you for, for coming out. Um, mine was sort of an empirical chapter. It was essentially to say, what is the, the problem with conservatism, the Republican Party, as it relates to the middle class? And it defined it in two ways. One is that there's actually a technical definition for who comprises the middle class. It's roughly 40,000 a year annually to about 120,000 a year. But in fact, the vast majority, 85% uh, of, of the American people consider themselves in the middle class, uh, even if it doesn't fall exactly within those those parameters. Um, so one was, a, was just empirically to try and say, who is the middle class? Uh, the second is to try and capture what the mood of the middle class um, is right now. And that is essentially a, a kind of entrenched vulnerability right now. Um, and people have a sense that, particularly the last 15 years, have not been good years mm. for them economically. They've been working uh, more and more hours uh, and essentially staying uh, static, flat. Uh, their conditions have, have not improved. I think that there has been um, a tendency among some elements within conservatism to try and convince the middle class that they're in better shape than, than they feel that they are. Uh, that usually didn't work in politics. To some extent, you have to connect with, with where people are and then sort of channel those, those concerns. But I actually think having written this chapter, gone through the data that, that there are uh, legitimate reasons for that the public feels it the way that, it, that they do. Uh, we can get into it in, in Q&A, but there are a lot of seismic shifts, um, factors that have gone on that you can't lay at the feet of Republicans or Democrats. These, these have to do with deep economic trends that, that has caused that. And then the third element of, of the introductory chapter was where the American people, how do they view the two parties as it relates to the middle class? And the short answer is um, that they don't like or trust either one, but they feel like the Democrats speak more to their concerns than Republicans by a fairly sub substantial margin. Uh, the Republican Party has the reputation among a lot of Americans of being the party of the rich and not the middle class. And, uh, and so there's an electoral and, 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 uh, and political problem. So we wanted to, at the outset of the book to, to, uh, to state that, uh, that. In terms of what reform conservatism is, I mean, I agree with what April and, and Ramesh said. Um, one is it's an effort to try and modernize conservatism. Um, I, I very much agree with what Ramesh said. There is a way in which Ronald Reagan is such a large figure uh, in, in the Republican imagination uh, that much like FDR was to, for Democrats, and I think for, for understandable uh, reasons, but at some point, 30, 35 years after uh, Ronald Reagan was elected, you've, you've got to get on with life uh, and you have to adjust to the realities that we face and, and the problems facing the country, which is very different than, than Reagan faced. Um, and Reagan himself, this is forgotten, he was actually quite a creative thinker. Uh, he uh, articulated his agenda uh, to face the problems of, uh, of his time so I, I uh, do think that there's been a problem uh, with that. Two other points briefly, and we can, we can go on. Um, when we talk about reform conservatism, at least as I understand it, it does embody or touch on a certain view of government. Everybody that's a part of the movement, I think, believes in limited government. But uh, I think within the various strands of conservatism, there's a kind of deep hostility in some segments of conservatism toward government, an almost visceral anti-government um, approach to things. And uh, that's not uh, how I think uh, conservatives ought to approach it. Um, and that conservatives need to think and articulate what are the purposes of government, not just the size of government. And I think the instinct here is uh, almost always to talk about the size of, uh, of government. Last thing I'll say is I think there's a kind of dispositional or temperamental element uh, to conservatism too. Uh, and I, I think most of the people probably that are associated with, with the reform conservative group um, would con count themselves, say, more of the Burkean tradition of conservatism. Um, and I think the apocalyptic rhetoric and some of the 
some of the, what I would argue would be some of the reckless rhetoric that characterizes conservatism today is, is probably not one that you associate as much with, with uh, those of us in the reform. So I think that raises an interesting question then. Um, at times when I've used the term reform conservatism in conversation, uh, it has actually been interpreted to, to sort of be what you, April, said it is not intended to right. be, which is that it is here to reform conservatism mm -hmm. instead of to be right. a movement about conservative reforms. Um, and uh, at times when I, I've heard the phrase reform conservatism, it's, it's been used as sort of code for well, Republicans just need to be more moderate. Right. Um, and and I've, I've heard pushback from some that that's not right. actually the case. Uh, th that actually, if you think about reform conservatism on that left-right axis, that's the wrong way of thinking about it. Um, th and this is for any of you. I mean, is that the wrong way to think about the goals of reform conservatism? That it's not about moving a political party along a spectrum, but that its aims are somewhat different? Sure, well, I'll, I'll start and, and, uh, and then the answers will improve. Uh, I think it is the wrong way to view it. Um, it's, it's not an effort to reform conservatism. Uh, and I think the, when, when we talk about reform conservatism, it has to do with the reform of, of government institutions. Um, and, and it's, I think the presupposition here is that a lot of our institutions, whether you're talking about uh, Medicare and entitlement programs, the education system, the immigration system, the tax code, uh, in many cases, these things were created in the early part of the last century, and the country is in a very different demographic uh, situation than it was then. So some of this is just literally the reform of public institutions in ways that we think uh, would improve them and, and are conservative in their orientation, which is market mechanisms, choice and competition, um, that, that kind of thing. Um, the agenda itself, uh, if it were actually to be implemented, if you implemented what's in this book, um, that would be a pretty bold and, and, and uh, even in some respects a dramatic departure from what we have now. We would all argue that it would be better for the public good, for the public interest, but this is not a kind of moderate, sort of squishy uh, approach. And, and I want to use one illustration about how this gets kind of confused by referring to the 2012 campaign and Michelle Bachman. Michelle Bachman was and is a, a star within the, the Tea Party, which is con considered by, by many people to be the more of the conservative um, side of things. She used the language of kind of a fierce anti-government language, limited government, as in an abstract way. But when she was asked about the reform of Medicare, and Paul Ryan had put forth a very bold, far-reaching reform of Medicare, um, she pulled back. She said, we really can't touch this program, that, that you know, the elderly are an important part of the Republican uh, constituency. And so when it came to the practical um, management of various programs, she was the one who, who, in my estimation, didn't go far enough. So what you have is a situation in which, in my judgment, some of the rhetoric is, that needs to be dialed down about 20%, and the actual policy uh, uh, prescriptions need to actually be be bolder, and I thought she kind of embodied what this what this uh, what this problem was. Well, you know, it's it's interesting. I think um, so much of conservatism has just been liberalism light. It's how can we do the same thing but cheaper? You know, how can we cut ten percent or fifteen percent off the top? Um, and I think that's not what we're about at all, and that's what sort of makes us different uh, than I think a lot of establishment kind of republicanism and what makes what's going on in reform conservatism interesting. Um, it's a dramatic, I think, rethinking of, uh, you know, the, the purpose, uh, the, the way that we've designed these institutions and, and you know, that they've become cumbersome and sclerotic um, of, as they've aged and are no longer uh, sort of fit for our times. You know, we're, we're in an age now where things across the board and society are becoming much more streamlined and responsive uh, to, vin to individual concerns. Um, you know, you can't go to the dairy aisle in a, in a grocery store without seeing, you know, 20 different kinds of milk. Uh, so so the, the market is very responsive to the, the concerns of individuals. And at the same, it's just remarkable that at the same time the government seems to be going in, in a different direction. Um, you know, you see with healthcare, right? It's it's what we've done is taken healthcare in a much more, um, you know, centralized, uh, uh, you know, 
technocratic sort of um, delivery system. And, and I think what we're trying to do is rethink that. We're, we're saying, isn't there a better way to do this? And one that's more in line with the Constitution and our constitutional framework, um, but also that's, you know, look, like that's just gonna, that, that serves people where they live, right? And Yuval Levin does this great job in one of our introductory chapel, chapters of explaining sort of where we're coming from uh, in terms of preserving the space between the individual and the government. And that, for conservatives, is where everything that's really important and interesting happens. Um, it's, we, we, it's not a sort of radical individualism, and, it's, and, and we don't think that every, all of these public goods can only be met by state action. We think that there's all kinds of interesting things that happen in between, right? There's institutions like Harvard, and there's institutions um, you know, churches and schools and community groups and uh, charities and you name it. And, and the, the goal of government, the important thing about government is to sort of um, strengthen and bolster those institutions to, to um, give people the chance to sort of create markets and help themselves. And that's where conservatives coming from. And I think what's great about that is that it's, it really is a departure from what a lot of Republicans and conservatives have been thinking for the last 20 years or so, which is just that we should cut, yeah. you know? And so it's, it's a little more creative, I think it's a little more dynamic, and it's, in that sense, I think much more interesting. Yeah, I, I think that um, on this question of sort of moving left or right, I'd, I'd, I'd make two points. One is that I think reform conservatism is much more about broadening the conservative agenda to uh, include some policy fields where conservatives have historically had too little to say. Uh, and healthcare is a great example of that, where conservatives have tended to be entirely reactive and oppositional um, rather than um, coming up with uh, conservative, conservatively rooted mm -hmm. healthcare policies. So, for example, if you look at the, the chapter in our book on healthcare that, that Jim Capretta wrote, it outlines an alternative to the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, as it's often called, that um, attempts to get an equal or greater number of people um, covered with health insurance at a lower cost, with less coercion, less attempt to centrally, man or cent centrally manage um, health care. Um, now, some, you could talk about that as Obamacare light, as, uh, as some people do, but really the res end result of it is a much more market-oriented health care policy, not only compared to Obamacare, but compared to what we had before Obamacare, the federal government through its tax policy, through its regulation, through the way that it directs spending, would have a smaller role in American health care, uh, and a less distortive role in American health care than it's had for decades. Now, I think that in a way, when you, if you presented that agenda, it would look a little bit more moderate than the Republican Party has sometimes looked in recent years, because conservatism has gotten into this habit of sort of defining itself in terms of attitude and style um, and, uh, and just sort of rhetorical aggressiveness, which I think is part of what Pete was getting at. And um, if you're a more solution-oriented, practical conservatism, you can do rather less of that sort of thing while still being uh, as ideologically conservative and maybe in some ways even more so. So my next question gets into how this becomes reality, how this goes from sort of right. the pages of, of an interesting book and the, the sorts of things that are written about by the thinkers in our think tanks and becomes something that the doers, the policy makers, can really take and run with. What are the prospects for reform conservatism, the sorts of things that are written about here, the sorts of things that are written about in uh, you know, incredible journals like National Affairs, I mean, what is the prospect for these ideas to actually become implemented policy sometime within the next five to ten years and to change the way our candidates for office yeah. run. I mean, yeah. what, is the, what is the likelihood that someone running in 2016 is pointing to things from, from this policy agenda as they're running for president? Well, let's hope good. Um, that's my goal. Uh, you know, look, we've got a couple of folks, I think, who uh, most people would put in that 2016 field um, that are very interested in the work we're doing. Uh, I think uh, Paul Ryan and Marco Rubio have both uh, shown interest, uh, expressed interest, and I think that there really are very few people that are considering running in 2016 that wouldn't actually be open 
um, to the things that are that are in our agenda. Look, you know, so it's really hard to drive an agenda from the House. Um, it's uh, you know when you when you've got. Uh, Democrats running the Senate and you've got a Democratic president and so you know I have some um, sympathy there that it's it's really hard to sort of take something this big and move it uh, I think what it's going to require is, is a presidential candidate to sort of elevate some of these ideas um, the great news is we you know two weeks ago we had um, Rubio Senator Rubio and Senator Mike Lee both uh, introduced a tax plan that is both pro-family along the lines of what we have in this book uh, dramatically increasing the child tax credit, uh, and also you know pro uh, pro business, um, you know business expensing and all kinds of things that I think show that we can be about growing the economy and about families. So you're already seeing I think two you know very important senators, and let's not let's not fail to mention that you know Senator Lee is is I think has impeccable conservative credentials, um, and is really helping to sort of bring along folks who have have perhaps yeah. been less, you know, <clears throat> interested in these debates. In 2016, for the first time in 16 years, we'll have a Republican presidential candidate who's not running in the immediate aftermath of a Republican <clears throat> administration and is also not running against a Democratic incumbent, right? So it's not the 08 right. or the 12 situations where for various reasons there just wasn't much of an agenda presented. I think that means that that candidate is going to have to present an agenda partly be in order to capitalize on the time for a change sentiment that there would normally be at the end of an eight-year presidency. If the candidate goes looking for a conservative agenda, I don't see many alternatives to the type of agenda that we're laying out here. I mean, the Republican Party has been consumed by this debate between the establishment and the Tea Parties, but neither side really has much of a program. Uh, and so uh, I think that we are going to be able to fill this back, and we've already seen Senator John Thune introduce some plans to change the way we help the um, unemployed. We've seen Rubio and Ryan talk about new approaches to poverty. We've got a decent health care plan out of Coburn and Hatch and Burr, um, and so on and so forth. I think that there, that's the first step. You've got these individuals sort of poking their heads up, um, not suffering, not being attacked. Uh, because they are engaging in some new thinking. But the next step really does, I think, have to be some of these presidential candidates. And I suppose if you're looking at it in the glass half full way, is the good news is there are a lot of Republican presidential candidates out there who have unformed policy agendas. <laughs> Tate, when I think about you know, the role that you played in, in the Bush White House, I mean, you really sat at that intersection between the thinkers and the doers, right? You were in the White House, you were in the, in the executive branch where, where action could really happen. We're still very plugged in with, with sort of the think tank world and where a lot of uh, great ideas were coming from. Um, what do you think is the prospect for reform conservatism to serve as that bridge between the thinkers and the doers for Republicans moving forward? I think it's pretty good. Uh, you know, I've been sort of filling in this field for a long time. I, I went back and I wrote a piece in the Washington Post in 2008 before McCain got beat by Obama. And if you took the last couple paragraphs I wrote, it would fit exactly with what is being said now. But it just didn't take. Um, and you can make arguments in politics and nobody pays attention and then there's certain things change. You're not always sure why, but there are times in which certain arguments or certain policies in a moment meet. I, and I think we're getting close to that. I don't want to over, over you know, promise, we don't know. And I completely agree, it's just going to depend on who the 2016 candidate is because that's how you really define, define a party. But I, I'd say a couple of things on why I'm, I'm more sanguine about this than, than in, in the past. One is I think Ramesh is quite right. There's not, um, there's not a lot out there that's actually competing against it. There's a lot of kind of rhetorical posturing. Mm -hmm. But if you said, what is the actual governing agenda that competes with this, it's not out there, which is I think explains one of the reasons why there hasn't been a lot of pushback to, to, uh, to this um, uh, agenda. I'd also say um, that I think that the government shutdown, which was a year ago this month, October of, of last year, was an important moment for the Republican Party. Um, it was an odd thing. When, so when Romney lost in, in, in 2012, there were, I, I sense that there was a beginning of a rethinking of the Republican Party. My own view, for what it's worth, is that I think that the Republican Party faced some fairly deep structural issues, and we're somewhat analogous to where the Democratic Party was when Bill 
with Bill Clinton and the Labor Party was with Tony Blair. That is, those were two figures that had to come in and change the party in significant ways. Um, and they did that both through um, symbolic issues and, and substantive changes. The, the Republican Party was beginning to, to go through that. For a variety of reasons, you, you got the government shut down, um, which I thought was a horrible idea before, uh, during, and after, and I think it's empirically demonstrable. I think that that sent, a, in my own experience in talking to Republicans on Capitol Hill and elsewhere, that that uh, was a wake up moment for, for a lot of Republicans. They said, look, this is, this is a dead end. This isn't gonna work. We need something else. They didn't know what something else was. And in fact, when the three of us got together to talk about this book before it was a book, the idea, I think that our supposition was that there were people looking for an agenda. Mm -hmm. And what we needed to produce was something where they could say, look, I'm in favor of a kind of of conservative governing agenda and here it is, and that's really what, what came, uh, came out of this. Uh, and then there are other signs of it. Orrin Hatch, of all people, gave a speech just the other day, which was very much consistent with some of the arguments that, 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 we've, that we've made. Mike Lee and, and, uh, and, and Marco Rubio, who were both mentioned, they were two of the three key figures who led the government shutdown. Um, but now, I think they would associate themselves much more with what I think we're trying to do. And they've been very impressive. They have put forward a whole series of, of policies on a range of issues, uh, which has gotten, gotten uh, good, uh, good attention. So, look, I don't know, and if, uh, if uh, Ted Cruz was the nominee, that would be one thing, and if, uh, if Marco Rubio was the nominee, it would, be, it, it would be another. But I do think if you look at the landscape of sort of leaders of the Republican Party, those who would fall more or less within the reform conservative movement, I think would be Rubio uh, and, uh, and Paul Ryan, uh, former Governor Jeb Bush, um, and, and, and in the Senate, Mike Lee, and I think that's a good sign. So I have one more question for you, but before I ask it, uh, after that we'll be opening the questions up to the floor. Um, there are microphones located, uh, two down here and two up in the boxes. Uh, so if you have a question, feel free to line up and I'll be sort of calling on folks uh, the rules for questions are when you ask to identify yourself and your affiliation, uh, to ask one question, making it brief, no speeches, and perhaps my favorite of the JFK Junior Forum guidelines, your question must end in a question mark. Uh, so if you have any questions, um, please go ahead and move up to the microphones. Uh, but I'll ask one final question of all of you before turning it over. Uh, looking very short term, within the next month, there's going to be a major election. Uh, the U.S. Senate may change hands. Um, it is unlikely that the U.S. House of Representatives will. A variety of governors' mansions could go either way. Uh, and I have heard it said, and, and uh, feel free to push back against this assertion, that this election is an election about nothing. Um, that sort of neither party is really running on a robust agenda in any way. Uh, that, that each party is sort of choosing issues that are third tier issues yeah. to make their negative ads about, and that this is not a broad agenda, uh, an election that is about broad issues. And as a result of that, um, I worry that if Republicans have a very good night uh, a, a few weeks from now, that it will be a, a false positive. It's sort of the way that I view 2010 as having been a bit of a false positive, that prevented the right from making the sorts of reforms to itself that it needed to for its long-term viability. Uh, Am I alone in being concerned about uh, 2014 midterms going well for Republicans and that, in effect, making it less easy for the right to make the changes it needs to make? Well, I mean, I think you're right, first of all, that it's, it is largely an election about nothing. I think 2012 was largely an election about nothing. Um, and, uh, you know, look, that's part of the reason it was so personality driven and, uh, you know, uninteresting, I think, to a lot of American voters. Um, you know, do we, um, uh, you know, do we worry about what a Republican Senate would look like and what they would offer? I mean, yes, there's, you know, they, they've certainly got to come up with something. Uh, they've got to have um, some ideas to show that they could govern, I think. Um, how many of those they could actually get past the filibuster, I think, is really a question, but they certainly need to have an agenda. Um, and I think, I'd like to think we've got a lot of things to offer them um, along that, that score. But you know, I, I think it is gonna be just much more, you know, very quickly this is gonna turn into a presidential cycle. And so again, I'm, I'm sort of um, 
I think thinking more yeah. along the lines of what those presidential candidates and who, who they will be and if they can take up this uh, banner. But there's certainly a lot of, I think, low-level interest in this that's you know, diffused among House and Senate members. I often, um, I often tell members who ask me to come in and, and talk to them, because there is a lot of interest, I think, in what we're doing. And uh, you know, they'll be freshmen or, or, or backbench members, not necessarily chairman of, yeah. of their committee. And I remind them, you know, look, Kemp, uh, when he, you know, proposed the the tax cuts, um, the Kemp Roth tax cuts, he was he wasn't even on the relevant committee, you know, and he did something pretty pretty dramatic. So there's, I think, a lot of ideas here that give um, give, you know, that will take some germination and will say will take some time. But there's nothing like having a presidential candidate, I think, to sort of carry those that message. So. It is a little disheartening the extent to which the Republican Party seems to have made almost a, a conscious corporate decision um, not to run on anything, just to bank on the unpopularity of the president, particularly in uh, the states where a lot of the Senate races are happening, um, to uh, carry them to victory. But what I think is even odder about this political moment is the extent to which the governing party is also running um, more as an, you know, what they're against, you know, that's, I think, what the war on women um, is about, uh, and not really so much on their achievements uh, in the past or what they are looking forward to accomplishing in the future. I just think um, that uh, that is in part a reflection of a kind of intellectual exhaustion. I mean, we've talked, we've, in my day-to-day -day life, I concentrate on the staleness and exhaustion of a lot of the old conservative agenda, but if you think about what the liberal agenda is, whether it's pre-K funding or uh, raising the minimum wage, this is an agenda that would have been recognizably the democratic agenda of 1938 or 1965. Um, and I, it makes me think that if a party were to offer um, some new ideas and were to, pr to talk to people uh, the way they understand themselves rather than the way the Republicans often do, which is to talk to people as though they're all budding entrepreneurs, or the way Democrats sometimes do, which is uh, talking to people as though they all think of themselves as victims in need of rescue by the federal government, although I think that party could uh, have a lot of potential to form a new governing majority. Yeah, I'd say uh, a couple things on, on the election being about nothing. I, probably a little bit more sympathetic. I tend to think that midterms tend to be elections of, of nothing by, by what you mean in terms of the question. I think if you go back to 82 or 86 or 98 or 2006, um, those were largely elections, I think you would say, of nothing. It's, it's, it's the nature of what midterm elections uh, are. Um, and a lot of these races are local and things that we may care about because we follow national politics. Um, there, there may be race certainly on the district level when you're, when you're running for the House that'll interest people that doesn't interest us and we think, well, this isn't about nothing. Second, I, I do think the Affordable Care Act is, 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 a, is a big issue um, in this election and that ain't nothing, that's something. That's the biggest transformation uh, of, of you know, in terms of transformative programs since the Great Society and, uh, and, and that, uh, that matters. I do think that there is, there is a, a, a um, habit of mind with, within the Republican Party that just is, a, is somewhat reticent and afraid about putting forth kind of bold ideas or speaking as a party to, to, put, them, to put them forward. Um, and, and I think there's a calculation here, and I don't even think it's necessarily a wrong calculation, which is that the president is uh, so unpopular uh, and the political environment is so toxic that the Republican Party can do quite well with just focusing on him. Now that's arguing against interest slightly in terms of my own view on these things, because I'd rather have a positive uh, governing um, agenda. But they may do well just making this a referendum on the president. But I do agree with you, Kristen, that uh, you, you say false positive term I've used is a false dawn. I thought 2010 was a false dawn. It, the Republicans and the Romney campaign made the judgment that this huge historic election in 2010 for Republicans showed that the public had made a judgment about Obama and, and Democrats, and that they could run and win on the presidential level based on a, making this a referendum on, the, on Barack Obama. And that not only didn't work, it backfired badly. Uh, Obama won um, 11 out of 12 uh, battleground states. So the concern here is that Republicans do take back the Senate, and they think well, we can do this again, 
2016 will be our time. We've now had an unpopular two-term president and things will just sort of inevitably go our way. And I just don't think that's the case. There's a big distinction between winning on a presidential level and winning at a midterm level. And if Republicans do well in 2014, in 24 days, whatever it is, and they think, well, we, don't, we, we can go kind of de minimis on the agenda and on the, on the presidential side, I think they'll, they'll rue that day. If I, if I could just add one more thing. Sure. I have nothing against negative campaigning. There's a lot to be negative about. But um, on the Affordable Care Act, Republicans are running as people who are hostile to the Affordable Care Act. They're not running as people who have any serious plan to repeal it that's or right. replace it or reform it. And that's what concerns me. That I, I, I have nothing, I, I have no objection to running a campaign which, when you're talking about health care, is 80% a negative message about the Affordable Care Act. But I do think you need that additional 20% that closes the case by saying, and there's a better way. Right, and I, I agree, agree completely. So I think now it's time to turn to uh, the audience. I'll start up here in the top. Uh, if you wouldn't mind again, please identify yourself, your affiliation, keep it brief, end with a question mark. Okay, awesome. Hi, my name is Aubrey. I'm a sophomore at the college and I'm the publisher for the Harvard Salient. So I was wondering who you think that uh, reform conservatism will most appeal to. Do you think it'll be non-voters or people who are usually on the fence and you can craft it to appeal to them? Or will it be mostly for members of the party currently who are looking for something to get behind? I think it could potentially have pretty broad appeal. You know, if you think about, you know, Peter was uh, drawing the parallel to the position of the Democrats in the late 1980s and early 1990s and needing to reform themselves. You think about the great sort of uh, breaks with the past of the Democratic Party in 1992. It's when Bill Clinton comes out for the death penalty for ending welfare as we know it and, and uh, comes out against, um, you know, Sister Soldier who had called for black people to uh, not kill each other but kill white people instead, if I vaguely remember the way that went down. Well, none of those things were, none of the Clinton positions were unpopular among rank and file Democratic voters. They were things that raised hackles among a thin slice of Democratic activists. And I think that we are in something of a similar position in that rank and file conservatives uh, are not tied to the idea that we should never have our own health care plan. Uh, they're not tied to the idea that our tax policy has to be single-mindedly about bringing the capital gains tax rate and the top income tax rate down. So I think there is a potential to unite most conservatives with the public at large. And you'll notice also that when we talk about demographics, we're talking about a, a group, the middle class, which is essentially the entire electorate, right? 85 to 86% of the public. It's not an attempt to slice the electorate into tiny bits and say, we're gonna, do a, we're gonna move the dial up here and here. It's an attempt to say, look, we can raise our, our standing across the board by seeing as people who are in touch with most people. And that way, I think you can do better among young people, you can do better among women, you can do better among Hispanics, et cetera, uh, without having to have group-specific appeals. I'd just say, um, quickly, the, um, I, I think most of what it needs to do is to pull in people that are not now voting for the Republican um, Party. Uh, Republicans, just on the presidential level, are not winning enough votes. Uh, they've lost five out of six of the last pre six presidential elections in the popular vote and four out of six on the, uh, on the electoral side. And the country is changing. It's changing demographically. It's changing in a lot of different ways. And right now, the Republican Party is in a position of having to persuade people who are not now voting for them but who could vote for them. And that's really who they, who they have to... Uh, to, to bring over, and I do think in terms of temperament and mindset, I mentioned that earlier, you find, this is very kind of rough and simplistic, but you do find in politics, and politicians, when they speak and, and how they carry themselves, they have two different groups in mind. Some people um, think of the base and speak in ways that are meant to sort of energize and rally and excite the base. Uh, this is a kind of preaching to the choir. And other people think of folks who are out there who aren't with them but could be with them. And it's the language and the tone and, and the agenda of persuasion. Uh, it's okay to be the former if you're the dominant party in American politics, uh, but that's not the Republican situation now. So they've gotta bring people over uh, now. Uh, so that's one. Second is, I just wanna underscore what Ramesh said, is very important 
if you look at the examples of people who've successfully reformed their parties, and, and the recent ones would be, I think, Clinton and Blair, they didn't detonate the base. Um, they were careful about it. If you go back and study what Clinton and Blair did, um, they didn't declare war on their base. They took certain issues, also a lot of times like sister soldier and welfare reform, which were symbolic. It, some of them were substance, some of them were not, but it was meant to send a signal to the people who weren't voting for them, we get it, we're in some important ways a different party, we're going in a, in a, uh, in a different direction. But if you've got somebody that decides that they want to uh, declare war on the base of the party, uh, that's just gonna be a disaster. Question from over here. Hi, um, my name is John, I'm a sophomore at the college. Hey. And uh, just say hypothetically, uh, this works great. Paul Ryan is a reformed conservative president in 2016. Um, at that point, though, the Republicans still wouldn't have a supermajority in the Senate, and you know, actually implementing any of these ideas would require uh, getting a fair number of Democrats on board with, you know, undoing the Affordable Care Act, serious like Social Security reform ideas like that. Um, so what is the sort of long-term plan for actually getting from beyond just having a president to implementing these ideas in actual law? Wow, I love that you're just giving us a president, because that would be, <laughs> <laughs> that would that would make be amazing. Easier, yeah. um, you know, and look, maybe we get to a place where we have a, you know, enough numbers in the Senate. I'd certainly like to think that's possible. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of ideas in here that I think Democrats could get on board for. Um, I, I don't see any reason why they should be opposed to an expanded child credit. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't, uh, I, I think healthcare is gonna be tricky. Um, it's gonna be really tricky. But, um, you know, the force of some of these ideas and the logic of them, I think is, you know, there, there's, there'll be a constituency for them. And, um, you know, we'll just have to fight one battle at a time. Some of these things you can fight out in budget reconciliation processes where you can do it with, a, 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 you know, a, a, a slim majority. Um, but no, I, I think we're just obviously gonna have to build support. I mean, that's something that takes time and, you know, a, a lot of political capital. But I'll say, I, I think a lot of the, you know, one of the advantages of a lot of the proposals in here is that because of their broad appeal, um, they're the types of things that will help us build that political capital with the public um, mm -hmm. so that we can do some of the difficult things that we wanna do or some of the, uh, the things that, you know, haven't gained as much traction but we think are import as important as conservatives. Um, and so, you know, hopefully, hopefully this uh, kind of attractive agenda will, will give us a little bit more uh, capital than we've got right now. I, I can attest to the, the fact that uh, at least some Democrats are surprised by what they, what they see in here. I've been on MSNBC and I've talked about sort of the stuff from Michael Strain's chapter mm -hmm. on um, unemployment and job creation and I've talked about, you know, he, he views there as being a role for the government in terms of unemployment right. insurance and possibly wage subsidies and uh, to deal with long-term unemployment and, and I get these looks from the hosts like, that can't possibly be a conservative who said that but there's, I think there is actually a lot in here um, that isn't just just for uh, just for the right. Well, it's like you know Pete said. I mean, it, it's sort of unorthodox um, in, in some senses, right? This is I, I, we like to think of it as very much you know it's sort of conservative. It's, it's, it's philosophically conservative, and it's it's a, a really uh, sort of constitutional. Um, fra you know, we're, we're thinking from a constitutional perspective. Um, but that, that also means that we think there is a role for government and it's to, you know, it doesn't mean that the answer is always kicking them out. It means that maybe we just need to reimagine um, the ways that we deal with some of the, the problems that face us and, and to empower, you know, and empower again those, you know, the civil society. Um, well, of the chapters in the book, I think you've zeroed in on the one. Healthcare is the one where it is hardest to picture um, some kind of bipartisan resolution. The rest, I think you can see it. On health care, the one thing I would say is, you know, we have this idea that the Affordable Care Act is becoming more entrenched. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously there are important respects in which that is true, but there's also an enormous amount of flux surrounding the Affordable Care Act. Uh, it is a little bit of a moving target. And I don't mean by that merely that which parts of it are actually implemented seems to be at the discretion of this administration. But also, even looking at the terms of the law, uh, the uh, IPAB, Medicare uh, rationing boards kicks in in the next, the next presidency. The Cadillac tax kicks in 
in the next presidency. Apparently, the individual mandate and the employer mandate are essentially going to kick in in the next presidency. Um, so I think, uh, and, and then also in the next presidency, the insurer, the subsidies to the insurers um, that have made the thing work to the extent that it has worked uh, disappear. So I think that in a lot of respects, it is hard to say what the system is going to look like right. in the year 2017, even if there is no further legislative action. And it could, in some ways, reopen the argument um, in the Congress in, in a way that's just unavoidable. And I, I don't mean to minimize that how important healthcare is to liberals because I do think it's like the crown jewel of liberalism, and they'll be hard, you know, we'll have to wrest it from them. Um, but I, but I do think that look, if there's, um, if there's a, uh, you know, it hasn't had a day of popularity, right? It hasn't had majority support since it was enacted. And I think if you're, if you don't have a president. Um, that's sort of, you know, pushing you to hold the line on, yeah, I, I think you're, there's a lot of possibilities for reforms where, we, you know, we could sort of hopefully dismantle this thing piece by piece and, and put together a plan, you know, if we have a vision for healthcare um, that, that is just more appealing to the public. Great, let me go ahead and get a question from over here. Sure, my name is Rick Corbett. I'm at Harvard Law School. Considering the enormous success of the gay rights movement over the past 10 to 20 years, and also that a third of gays and lesbians voted for Bush in 2000, how do you see the Republican Party adapting policy to, one, make, make sure that gay and lesbian conservatives and libertarians feel like they have a place, and then also get more gay rights voters to vote for the Republican Party? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll uh, tackle one. Um, Go ahead now. Well, look, I mean, I think uh, public opinion on uh, same-sex marriage and a lot of issues surrounding gay rights um, has rapidly shifted, and that is shifting, albeit somewhat less rapidly, among Republicans as well. Um, you are absolutely right. There is a fraction of uh, gays and lesbians, that's a significant fraction, uh, who have voted Republican and have continued, actually, to vote Republican in more recent cycles, so there's a base on which to build. I suspect that there is going to continue to be change uh, uh, among Republicans on this issue. Uh, and my guess is the next Republican presidential nominee is going to be somebody who opposes same-sex marriage, but also says, I understand, most people feel differently. Um, a lot of states are now have it. Maybe by that point, the entire country will have it, thanks to the Supreme Court, and will say, you know, the president whatever his views doesn't really have much to do with that. Now that is not going to be an answer that is satisfying for a lot of people who support same-sex marriage. Uh, there will be a significant number of people for whom that's a deal breaker, but I think a lot of other people, um, it will cease to be quite as much of an issue, uh, and that this is an issue which oddly, where, where the, the cause has triumphed so rapidly and so completely that it moves from being a winning issue for the Republicans to being a dead issue without really ever going through the intervening stage of being a serious winning issue for the Democrats, which by the way, I don't believe that there is strong evidence that it was in 2012, and I don't believe there's strong evidence that, there, that it is this year either. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I think that's, that's right. I think <clears throat> because of the reasons that Ron has said, the, the public has changed so much. I think this is going to become increasingly a dead issue. Um, I don't find Republicans, um, hardly any Republicans, really want to deal with this issue. They kind of hate it uh, in terms of if, there, if there's opposition to it. Um, and Republicans and conservatives have to make their own inner peace with a same-sex marriage world. That is to say, if you care about marriage as an institution, and I think people should, whatever you think of same-sex marriage, uh, you, we're gonna to have to adapt to it, and you're gonna to have to think through how can you strengthen the family uh, given those realities. Um, so, I, uh, so I don't think it's gonna be the, the issue that it has, and I think that it'll, you know, Republicans will be able to appeal to, to gay voters uh, on, on issues other than, uh, other than, uh, uh, than that. I, I actually think if you were in conversations, you, you might be surprised, you might not, but with religious conservatives, there are religious conservatives. Their issue now is religious liberties, less, less than, than stopping same-sex marriage. That is to say, they're worried that the federal government or other powers in, will, will force a Wheaton College, a Christian university, to have to adopt policies that because of their 
as they interpret their faith would, would go counter to that. So the real fear, if you actually talk among religious conservatives these days, is not same-sex marriage. It's religious, religious yeah, and, I, and I think the politics of that's a little different than the politics of same-sex marriage. I agree with that. I, I do think the, the politics are different. Great. Let me get a question hey. from over here. Good evening. My name is Wyatt Smith. I'm a student at Harvard Business School. Uh, prior to that, I served with Teach for America in Alabama. So my question is around how you see the education agenda shaping up for the 2016 cycle, and who do you see in the party that is leading on the issue that we should look for to shape the direction? That's a great question. There's so many chapters in here. I'm, I'm really interested in your take on this one. Yeah, uh, well, so we have two chapters in here that deal with education. One's higher ed, of course, and then a K through, K through 12 agenda. Um, you know, a couple, uh, the, both of those are really fantastic chapters. I think they're full of really interesting ideas. Um, who's leading on education? I mean, I would say higher ed's been sort of a more salient issue with um, conservatives of late. Um, the rapid, just unbelievable, you know, increase in the cost of higher education has just been uh, really demoralizing for a lot of Americans who think that both it's necessary to have a college, their children to have a college education to be in the middle class, and also that they you know, don't believe that they can afford it for their children. And so it's, it's really becoming an issue, I think, that has a lot of political salience and something that, that conservatives are wanting to tackle. Um, you know, Andrew Kelly in, the, in, a, in, this, uh, in this chapter, of course, has great um, ideas about what we do about that. Um, you know, I think Marco Rubio has been uh, probably one of the more prominent uh, members dealing with those issues. Um, you know, he thinks that we need to have sort of more uh, that like American families should have more um, information about when the, when they're looking at colleges. You know, if I if I want to send my kid to the local state college and they want to major in history, what are the returns on that look like? And right now we don't we don't know. We don't know how graduates fare uh, economically once they graduate if they're able to get a job in their field uh, of interest. So I think like having more. Uh, transparency and information available for, fam for families could be really transformative. Also, I think some uh, interesting ideas about you know how we finance um, how we finance higher ed and uh, you know whether or not we you know we could we could engage a sort of free market in providing some of those uh, some of those financing and, and hopefully some competitive pressure to bring those costs down. Um, maybe you want to talk about the K to twelve stuff. Well, you know I, I think that higher ed is a, is a is somewhere that has more potential in national politics just because there's this enormous um, level of, uh, not just level of federal subsidization, subsidization because of course there's, that's also present in K to 12, but you don't have quite as much of the, uh, the local state blob of uh, institutions that, um, that stands in the way of reform or that would have to implement any reform. Um, I think that, uh, you know, our chapter on K to 12 talks about school choice, not just as a matter of choice among schools, but also choice within schools, um, being able to supplement um, schools uh, in areas where parents uh, don't feel they're getting what they need, but they also, for various reasons, maybe they're in a rural area where there aren't, there aren't gonna be, you know, a bunch of different schools opening up, um, but they want some, some gap to be filled, and there are ways you can, you can do that. There are ways you can try to get teachers um, to, to see teachers as, unfortunately, conservatives sometimes see teachers as the enemy, uh, but in fact, there's, there are some ways in which more choices could actually help teachers. Um, so that I, think is a, that, I think, is an agenda that has a lot of promise, but would be primarily uh, advanced at the state and local level. Uh, but I do think that there's this higher education agenda that is more and more important and we were we've been talking a little bit about changes in our circumstances since the late 70s and early 1980s. Well, that was a period when you had extremely rapidly rising educational attainment, which you don't now. That was a period where you could be reasonably sure that if you had a college degree, you'd have a good job. Whereas in 2007, before the recession hit, 40% of people who have college degrees were holding jobs that didn't require college degrees. Um, so I think there's a sense in which the strategy of the last two generations of getting more people into traditional bricks and mortar, four-year higher education institutions has just maxed out in terms of its potential to make progress in our country. And of course, increasingly, probably not here, but in a lot of places, it takes six years to get that four-year degree on average. Um, and I think it's just a problem that has to be attacked on all fronts. You need alternative credentialing systems. You need alternative accreditation. 
you need more online options for learning. Mm -hmm. Um, because there, there are a lot of people, apprenticeship programs, there are a lot of people for whom that traditional model of higher education, they're just not suited for it for one reason or another, and we've got to expand those options. I'll just take off some things. I covered the substance well. Um, if you want to understand the Republican Party, my view of, with education, you think about this in the 2012 primary, Republican primary, there was more talk about electrified fences in the southern border than higher education. That's, um, that's a problem. Um, Second point is uh, we're having a debate within the, the Republican Party on the Common Core, um, and, and I'm not to say an advocate of the Common Core, but I think it reveals uh, some of the worst instincts or some of, the, some of the problematic instincts in the Republican Party, which is there's a ferocious energy against the Common Core, um, and not, not one, one hundredth of the energy in terms of what a positive education agenda would, would, would mean, and so that I worry about that. Third, in terms of who, who could talk about education, in terms of presidential candidates, I'd say Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio are probably the most obvious in terms of Florida connection. Uh, Jeb Bush knows that issue inside and out. He's actually for the Common Core, which is a toxic issue among a lot of the base, but he has a tremendous mastery of that issue, and, and Marco Rubio is impressive as well. Fourth point, it, education is a powerful issue. I just, I think conservatives really don't get it. Uh, George W. Bush used it very well in the 2000 campaign. It was authentic to him. He cared about education as a governor. The fact was that it, it was that kind of issue I was talking about earlier uh, as a symbolic issue. That was his way of saying when Newt Gingrich was very unpopular at that point in 2000 uh, to take on an issue and, and through that issue to signal to suburban voters, particularly suburban women, that the party is, is, uh, is a little bit different. Last point I'd say is I'm a big advocate of school choice for inner cities kids. Um, I, I think there's a moral argument for it as well as substantive, but too many Republicans and too many conservatives, if you ask them about education, they say school choice. It is not a issue on education that wins middle class voters. If anything, it may alienate them. Um, and the last thing is to underscore uh, Ramesh, the Republican Party, it's fine to be against the teacher unions. I think the teacher unions have done a lot of harm. They can't be seen as against teachers. Teachers are pretty popular uh, among parents, and too often there is by, by by tone and countenance and positioning a sense that the Republican Party is against teachers, and that's not good. So we've got time for one more question. Uh, so we'll go ahead up there. Thank you. So my name is Max. I'm a sophomore at the college. You talked about uh, incorporating more demographic groups, and at least to a first order approximation, it would seem that probably the main reason the Republican Party doesn't get a lot of minority votes is just because of their policies. I mean, if you look at how many states have passed voter ID laws, that, that can't possibly be attractive. If you look at the dozens of Republican governors who have rejected the Medicaid expansion, that's something that would get poor people health care, and so disproportionately you expect it to be popular among minorities. If you've watched Fox News or watched uh, John Stewart talking about Fox News during the recent Ferguson um, outbreak, you know, it, it's just sort of incredibly difficult to, to conceptualize what Republican policies are possibly going to be attractive to the groups that the Republican Party wants to incorporate. And so I guess my question is, you know, doesn't the Republican Party just have to make a lot of fundamental changes if, if they want to get do what you guys were talking about? Yeah. Well, I mean, the first change they need to make is to ask for their vote, which we don't ever do. Um, I mean, the, I can't tell you how many campaigns I've watched where they've never spoken to, you know, a black community or a Hispanic community. They don't go on, um, you know, minority radio or, or have any ads aimed at these communities. And so I think that's one thing we, we need to do. Um, second, I think the kind of agenda we're talking about right here is, is, is one that would benefit um, everybody. It's an economic agenda that I think, you know, look, blacks and Hispanics are, uh, you know, have, have suffered in this economy, you know, more than anybody. And I think they're, you know, looking for jobs. And I think if they saw a credible jobs plan and a, you know, a, a sense that they could get the kind, their, they and their children could get the kind of education um, that would, you know, lead them to a, a good job and that, that they're, um, you know, like a lot of these demographic groups that we obsess about, I think Ramesh's point that, like, this agenda sort of speaks to a lot of those specific demographic groups that we worry about, single women, Hispanics, you know, um, the, 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 all of these, you know, Republican pollsters and, um, you know, highly paid consultants tell everybody is the key to winning. Yeah. It's, they've also got a lot of other things on, in common, and one of those things they have in common is that they're less secure uh, financially, and they're less secure economically. And so providing an economic agenda, I think, is something we, we believe is at the top of their minds. 
and uh, we need to we need to build the case yeah. for it. We need to ask for their vote. Let me just add. I completely agree with that. Let me add um, two points. One, um, the margin matters. So um, if Republicans were going to get 15% of the African American vote, that wouldn't you know be a kind of prophetic margin, right? Of 85 to 15, but it would be so much better than getting 5%, um, which is what they have been doing lately. And so there is this tendency of Republicans saying, ah, what's the point? We're never going to win that vote. You don't have to win that vote. You've got to win some of those voters. You've got to make a marginal impact. Um, when we think about marginal analysis, when we talk about tax policy, <laughs> let's think about it when we talk about politics as well. Second, uh, I think Medicaid's a great example. Medicaid is a very crummy form of insurance, one that researchers have a hard time finding any positive physical health outcomes from compared to not having any insurance at all. Now, what if the Republican message weren't, we're going to take this Medicaid away from you and the financial security that it does, in fact, bring? Uh, and it, if the message wasn't, we're going to take that away from you and replace it with nothing, but was rather, we're going to spend a lot of the money we spend on Medicaid and allow it to be used for you to buy regular health insurance in the regular market, not in this subpar segregated market. I think that is a more attractive pitch. Now that is not something that is going to cause Republicans to get a majority of the Hispanic vote or a majority of the black vote, but it is, I think, going to improve their share of those things. Now there are other things that need to be done too. I do think a change in the way the party approaches voter ID, a way in the party, a change in the way the party approaches immigration, so on and so forth, all those things have to happen. But you also have to make a bread and butter pitch um, to these groups that, uh, in particular with black and Hispanics, make less income than the national average, are more economically insecure than the national average. Yeah, I, I subscribe to that. It's, you, Republicans don't have to win over a majority of, of Hispanic voters uh, or, or African American voters. They just have to make more inroads. George W. Bush won 40% of the Hispanic vote in 2004. That was a very high, high number. Uh, for, for Republicans, part of the reason that he, that he won, and he did very well in, in, uh, in 2000 as, as well. Um, look, my view on these things is, um, I'm a conservative, so I'm not, uh, I'm not interested in having conservatives go out and pretend they're liberals. Uh, I think uh, liberal, there are enough liberals out there, and I th uh, so I think we have to make the case. I do think we actually have an opening to make the case. Uh, my own view is that the Obama presidency, by the time it's done, is gonna be judged to be a failed presidency. And I think that some of these groups that you're talking about, say poverty, the numbers of poverty under, during the Obama years has gotten um, much, much higher. And the condition of the poor is, is, uh, is much worse. So it seems to me that there is an argument, a kind of op openness uh, to, to hear an alternative. Uh, in, in a way, conservatives have a certain advantage. Um, liberalism has, has been tried, uh, and, and uh, we've now been operating on a proposition because President Obama um, got through almost everything he wanted uh, in the first two years of his presidency. He was probably the most legislatively successful president since, since Lyndon Johnson. And uh, so he got what he wanted, and now the American people get to, to live uh, with, with the fruits of, of those uh, supposed successes. Um, I think, as a conservative, uh, it's not surprising to me that, that these policies are fail failing, but I think more and more people believe it's failing. So, for example, if you look at the issue of immigration, Numbers for Democrats and Obama on immigration have come down precipitously. And so I think that, that there are gonna be a whole group of, of people who are gonna be open to contrary arguments. The, the issue that Republicans and conservatives have to do, or the challenge they have, is to show why those policies will improve people's lives in a real and practical way. So it's not simply being against Medicare uh, or Medicaid uh, expansion. But Medicaid is, is, is a horrible program. It's not helping the poor, it's hurting it, and there are alternatives to it. Mm -hmm. But Republicans and conservatives don't have a, a policy knowledge or a vocabulary uh, that they need to have to make their case, and as April said, they don't often enough go to the groups and make, make that. Paul Ryan now is actually an exception to that. I think it's very admirable. He's making poverty a, uh, a top tier issue for him. I think that's morally right, but I think it's politically smart as well. Well, on that note, uh, I believe we are out of time. Everybody, the, you can get copies of Room to Grow, uh, I believe, at the IOP. Uh, make sure you pick up a copy. It'd be great reading for uh, over the long weekend. Uh, thank you to our panelists, uh, Ramesh, April, and Pete, for joining us. Uh, wonderful discussion. Thank you again for being here. Thanks for having me.